My name's Carol. I never expected to be a widow at 56. My husband Vince passed away from melanoma in 2004. He was 62. My name's Veronica. My husband Paul died at age 56 from melanoma. My name is Lisa. My husband Graham passed away in 2010 from melanoma aged 64. Vince and I had been married for nearly 35 years. He had a mole on the right hand side of his body, just underneath his armpit. I begged him to go to a doctor. It started to bleed and he still didn't go to the doctor. He eventually was admitted to hospital for an unrelated medical condition and at that time he asked the doctor would he please remove the mole under his armpit. A little bit later we found out that the mole was melanoma. Paul found a mole on his back when he was shaving one day. Couldn't see it but he could feel it, it was itchy. And he asked me to have a look at it. It was probably about the size of half of my little fingernail. And I was a little bit concerned and I asked him to go to the doctor. Uh, he didn't immediately go. Uh, a couple of weeks later I was at the doctor having my skin checked and it reminded me to remind him. And he went immediately then to the doctors. He then found out that was excised and found out that it was melanoma. And we pretty, pretty soon found out that it was a depth further than we wanted it to be. His first diagnosis of melanoma was when he was 56 uh, and a melanoma was removed from his neck with no further treatment needed. It was only a very um, small melanoma. There were no regular skin checks ordered and life seemed to be quite good after that. In 2008, after looking at a spot on his back that I didn't like and which hadn't been attended to, I asked him to see the doctor and ask that it be removed. It was a blistery type of uh, mark which didn't look like the melanoma he'd had on his neck. And when the, sur when the um, GP took it out and had it diagnosed, he rang my husband and said, you need to come in straight away. And he said, it's a melanoma and it's over three millimetres deep. He started on melanoma vaccine and we were hopeful that the, the melanoma hadn't spread. But by the December, he found a lump on his left arm and a biopsy was taken. Just not, not too long before Christmas, I rang up the melanoma unit and they gave me the news that there was melanoma in the lump on his arm. After the mole was removed, he had to have radiation therapy on the mole site. He had to have his lymph glands removed. In Christmas 2000, he quickly went in to have some surgery. As it had developed in, under his um, arms and into his chest, his left chest, and he had to have his whole chest removed and the lymph nodes taken from under his left arm as well. The specialist surgeon who uh, was quite used to melanoma was quite concerned and tried to get him in as quickly as possible to do the surgery. The lymphocentogram showed that the melanoma had travelled and so lymph nodes were removed. Now the sentinel node from under his left arm had metastasized, so 26 lymph nodes were removed and a little muscle in his left shoulder, weakening his left arm a little bit. He had to have a full body scan and it showed that he had two spots, two tumours in his, both in his lungs. After that, it spread to his spleen, his liver and his adrenal glands. He had severe pain 
in his well in his adrenal glands and he was admitted to hospital for a few days surgeries radiotherapy chemotherapy he helped with a vaccine a trial vaccine so he had a pick line in his arm for a long time he got septicemia from that he found out he had tumors in his lungs that frightened him August 2002, they found out he had a brain tumour. And that really frightened us. We thought, this is, this is not good. And then very quickly after that, he found out he had another two brain tumours that were inoperable. The only treatment that was available was still on a trial type of treatment. And um, that was started but it wasn't continued and my husband felt like he had very little other options uh, and apart from regular checks that was all that they could do for him. He'd suffered a little bit from lymphedema and then he started to feel nauseous. The doctor ordered tests, um, they did a blood test and they couldn't believe that from the May blood test to the June blood test his um, liver function test was deranged. The normal range is around 160, his was over 700. So they ordered scans. We had the scans and on the Friday, we went back to um, the MARTA for results. And the professor came in and said, I'm so sorry, the cancer is now in the liver and it's also traveling to the bones. And he said, how long have I got? And the doctor said, three months. Because of the, the effects on his brain, he started to lose his mobility and his speech. Eventually it was decided that he would have to have the tumours operated on, the tumours on his brain. He did that and he was in, in hospital for about three weeks but he was just a shadow, a shadow of a man. Had to be helped with everything. His speech and mobility came back a, a little bit, so he was finally released from hospital. Our house looked like it was a hospital ward. Had so many aids to help him with walking, with toileting, with showering. He needed help with every part of his life. Eventually, we had to get a hospital bed put into our room. I was just terrified every time he stood up that he was going to fall. He did, he did that on a few occasions and I had to get some help. Once the melanoma had gone to his brain, he took some fits and that was the most terrifying experience, both for him and for me. He knew what was happening, but he couldn't talk to me. And he finally passed away in our bedroom on the 8th of September, 2004. From the time that he had been diagnosed in June, 2003, it was just a period of 14 months, but because of what we went through, it seemed like the longest 14 months in our lives. He sent us home with medications to stop the nausea. But that night, as he began to be sick, he just, the nausea just continued despite the tablets and the medication that was given to us. Early on the morning, on the Saturday morning, Graham couldn't get back from the bathroom because of the weakened state he was in from the nausea. And at 11 o'clock he said to me, call the ambulance, I can't breathe. Because of all the nausea, his, he had renal failure, his kidneys stopped working. And the head of ICU said to me, if that doesn't, if we can't get the kidneys to work again, he only has 48 hours left. Uh, Professor Hersey suggested we go down to uh, Prince Alfred Hospital and they were confident that they could attack that particular 
brain tumour or those tumours with stereotactic radiotherapy, which meant his head would have to be in a cage for 10 days and it had to be down there in Sydney and we walked away from that and my son and I were with him and he said, no more. I've still got the tumours in my lungs. I've still got... It's everywhere. He said, I just want to go home. And he was able to stay home with the help of a wonderful palliative care team and nurses and my beautiful friends and my beautiful family. And we were lucky enough for him to be at home. When he passed away in... Um, April 2003. My husband lived 19 days. I watched him swell from the... Uh, they managed to get the, the kidneys to work to 30%, but he still retained fluid and couldn't move. He stopped eating because the nausea wasn't very comfortable for him. He found it was very painful. Um, I bathed him. I cared for him because he wanted me to look after him. I would have liked to have kept him at home, but that was medically impossible for me. Uh, he was in the oncology ward for nine days, and then I spoke to uh, the hospice, and the head, of, the head doctor there said, I have a bed for him if you want to move him to the hospice. Graham was frightened to move because of the pain that he was feeling but they gave him extra painkillers and moved him to the hospice where he lived for 10 days and passed away quietly. Vince has missed out on so much. Our granddaughter was born five weeks after Vince passed away. Her birth helped me a lot to focus on the future my son has had two children since then who he's never seen, and that breaks my heart. Graham loved to help me in the kitchen to prepare for Christmas lunches. And Christmas around the, the dinner table was a time when laughing and joking happened. And that has to change because on your own, holding it together is not so easy. Maybe because it's still a little raw but it affects your whole life and it affects your children's lives and your children's children and that's a tragedy. Unless you've been through it yourself, losing someone, no one ever knows what it's like. It certainly makes you stronger in some ways, um, in many ways. But there are so many times when you think, oh my God, I wish he was here. Vince and I never realised that one mole could lead to so much treatment and suffering. He was the per a sort of person who thought that going to the doctor was a sign of weakness. But if only he'd gone when he noticed his mole started to ch starting to change. Our whole lives could have been different. And he could still be here today. You can end up having numerous surgeries. And if you don't want to have your, half your chest taken off, if you don't want to have your lymph nodes taken out from under your arms. If you don't want to have lung, uh, lung cancer, if you don't want to have tumours in your brain, I'm sure you don't want to go there. I guess we never expect to lose the one we love. But when it happens because skin checks weren't done as they should have been done, uh, I want to emphasise how important that is, that wives or husbands check their partners' backs, particularly those areas that can't be seen. So I really, really encourage the women out there to get your men to do something about having regular skin checks. I'd like everyone to take the time to have their skin checked. It doesn't take long, but that 10 minutes or so that you have, have your skin checked might save your life. <laughs>